Happy to go. Want to welcome everybody to the North Lake Seventh day Adventist Church Sabbath School. We're glad that we can at least connect this way for a little bit and do some sharing together. And I see a few other people coming in. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for Sabbath. Thank you for your blessing wherever we are. And Lord, we have different burdens on our hearts. We have family members. We have situations with health. We have many different things that, that we're praying about. And we, we just pray that you'll be very near to us. Be near to Eric's family during this difficult time and, and each one of us. And Lord, send your spirit to be with us as we're sharing and, and praying and talking together today in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Paul is going to lead us through the discussion of Sabbath Sunday and Monday. So, Paul, I'm very glad you were able to get on, and, and we'll turn it over to you. Good morning to you. Good morning. morning. You, know, you find the message wherever you find it, and you don't know where it's going to be. This morning... I want to look at the E.G. White notes, and I want you to, to understand this, and I want you to feel it. <clears throat> we need to feel the vivifying influence of the Holy Spirit as the disciples felt it on the day of Pentecost. I want somebody to respond. Amen. <laughs> I was thinking, wow. Okay, what was that? Okay, anyway, it's oh done. <laughs> I heard you say something, but then it disappeared. Well, Eric said amen, and I just said, what else can we say, really? Well, we were not going to have that experience. That suppose until we get together like the disciples did. How would you feel? Homer? Yes. Okay, there you got it. We missed you a minute ago. Okay. Want to repeat it? I, Eric said amen, and we were just saying that what else can we say? We need to feel the vivifying influence of the Holy Spirit as the disciples felt it on the day of Pentecost. Question that Kathy had is, what does vivifying mean? Anybody? To give life. What was that, Eric? To give life. It comes from the same root. To give root life. As to impart vitality. Can you imagine being there on Pentecost and you're a part of what's going on. Get a hold of that. Does it does it influence you at all? Do you get charged up? Or is it well, yeah, that'd be interesting. You think about it. Somebody said, well, the of, sorry, go ahead. Well, we're not going to have that experience until we have the experience that they had before the Holy Spirit arrived with such power. I mean, if we don't pray for it, if we don't want it, then I don't think we're going to have that experience that the, that the uh, apostles had and the disciples. What had been going on for the last 40 days? The last What went on? Paul, well, they they were praying together. They were studying together. They were praising God in from home to home and in the temple and and different places. But what struck me was they didn't know that it was going to be forty days. All they knew is they were supposed to wait for the power to come, the Holy Spirit. They didn't know if it'd be five days or 300 days or, or how long it would be. Well, they waited for 40 days and Jesus was with them. 
what happened during those 40 days? Was Jesus preaching to the crowds and multitudes? No. No. What was he doing? He was talking with them and they were understanding more clearly, I think, what he was trying to tell them. The message was going straight to them. That's what it was all about. Now, the 10 days before Pentecost, what was happening? That's when they were in the upper room, wasn't it? They were in the upper room. What were they praying for? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. And all of a sudden, 10 days later, now you're looking at it and you say, do we pray for 10 days for something? Are we ready to pray for 10 days for something? Or is that too long? Maybe we pray for 10 minutes. Right? I, think, I think sometimes we pray even longer than that. I think sometimes we pray longer than the 40 days. I think sometimes we pray for an, until we get an answer that we feel is the answer that, that we were either looking for or that God is giving us. What have you prayed for recently? Nothing. Our grandchildren, for our church family, for our pastor, for ourselves, that we might be strong and be a light bearer. We we don't we don't look at things that prayer will answer. We don't comprehend that. Let me give you something that just happened yesterday. I was praying for keys. Have you ever lost your keys? Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're missing. They're not on the peg where they belong. Mm -hmm. And I was praying for them. And little did I realize that God had been setting this thing up for me for several months. Yeah, we found them. <laughs> Kathy's purse. And we know where they are now. But we didn't know. And we prayed for them. Where did they go? Are we are we praying for something as minuscule as keys? What do we pray for that is of value for eternity? How long do we pray for family members? Do we pray for them? Uh, we pray for them and we go on and we pray for them and go on. Uh, not a big deal, just that's what we pray for and we keep going. And it's not something that is going to hit us. <clears throat> Now, please look at your lesson. Pray for one another is the memory verse. Do we pray as much as we pray for keys? No, it's just something we pray for and, and we don't get agitated about it. We don't get look for the answer really. We have a family member that we're praying for. And we pray all the time, but we don't get agitated about it. We pray and yeah, that's included in our prayers, but what do we, what is it a real part of us? Pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Is that you and me? Or is it not? Sunday's lesson. 
What did you find in these three texts on Sunday morning? Well, there was war in heaven. War in heaven, that was revelation. And then what about the Ephesians text? That was they wrestled not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. Do we realize that? Probably not. I mean, I think we know it, but it, the keys are right there. We need those. Yeah, if, yeah. if somebody asks you, yeah, that's, that's what goes on. But do we really feel it? Probably not. Ah, uh, that's a battle that goes on and uh, don't get agitated about it, right? It's a battle that's going on all the time and is your battle with, with Satan, does it affect you? Sometimes. Sometimes. Sometimes you feel that, hey, he's after me. And, but usually it's, yeah, that's the way things go, right? Yep. That's what it is. What about the second Corinthians one? I can't read my own writing. You can, it got cold. <laughs> it says something about carnal, the weapons <clears throat> not carnal, but God is mighty. They drank from the same spiritual drink. We look at our friends, these people that you're looking at right now, plus you don't know who else is on there. What's the battle? The Do battle is for us. It's for our soul. Hmm? The battle is for our souls. We ought to be more interested in it, I guess. Is he winning? Satan? Yeah. Unfor unfortunately, sometimes. Sometimes is a good answer. We hope it comes to be never. Yeah. That's, that's our true. prayer, that it will never be. The Bible lifts the veil between the seen and the unseen world. How do you know what's going on in this unseen world? Is it, well, that's what some people believe, but it's, yeah, big deal. There is a struggle between good and evil. Um, I think that when the veil is lifted between the seen and the unseen world, I think that we definitely need to be aware of um, the, the forces that surround us that want to do us harm, but I think we all should also should be comforted that there are forces that are there for our protection and for our guidance. You think you have more power on your side than on his side? Absolutely. But do we accept that and do we respond to it? Uh, maybe. You know, I think when we watch the news, we can tell that there are, that there's forces out there, that there is a great controversy. And as I was studying this, I was thinking about, I was, should have looked it up, but there, in the old Christ in Song book, and there's a song, it's there are two ways for travelers, only two ways. One's, I can't remember, and I was going to look it up and I forgot, but that's it. There's only two ways. There's either God's way or the devil's way. There's no in between. Paul, Paul, Wade has his hand up. We can't really okay. see it, but he has his hand up. Wade? Hi. Good hey, morning. Good morning. I, I, I thought came to mind when we were talking just now about um, the difficulties and whether how much of God is on our side as opposed to the enemy. And I thought of a passage that says that the way of the transgressor is hard. And there's two reasons why it's hard. One is we understand that sin only leads to death and suffering. 
So we do, it is hard because of sin, but it's also hard because God, where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. And so God is making it difficult for us to be abstinent because if he says, take this yoke upon me, his yoke, because his burden is easy and light. And so that tells me that if we accept him into our lives the way that we are supposed to, that grace would much more abound in favor of us as opposed to darkness in favor of, of the devil. Look on down on um, Sunday's lesson. It is a part of God's plan to grant us in answer to the prayer of faith that which he would not bestow did we not thus ask. What does that mean? You don't ask, you don't get it. I think about the prayer of Jabez when, when you say that. He asked for blessings and God gave it to him. God gave it to him. Did God want to give it to him? Yes. But well, what was the need? Did he realize God was going to bless him or not? I imagine he did. I think we don't have because we don't ask. We don't have because we don't ask. So Paul, when when Cherie asked for a car, did you give her one? <laughs> I heard when Cherie asked for it, I didn't hear. Oh, when, when Cherie asked for a car, did you give her one? No, the, going back and forth, but I don't hear what the is. answer was. No, you did not get me a car when I asked for one. It's not there. <laughs> there there's a trick to the answer as well that I believe that God. I see Wade talking, but I don't hear him. Oh, we, we may. No, you're okay, Wade. We can hear you, but there's yeah. probably an internet connection. Okay. <laughs> No, I, I, is that, we have to, that we have to allow that. Just a minute. Sorry about that. I don't there know. we go. Okay. okay. No, I was just saying that I believe that the secret is that we have to align first with God, our wills with his will. And then the things that we desire that comes out of the well of everything that comes with our alliance with him would be in, in accordance with his will and he can grant us those things. And what are we looking for? Grants, yeah. Sometimes oh. he grants them at a time that's different from what we thought was the right time. Right. But as we harmonize with him, we also we also learn to harmonize with his timing. Okay. Are we ready to accept where he wants us to be? Probably the answer is maybe. So, Paul, we have two or three more minutes in this section. Okay. We're not going to get that. No. <laughs> Intercessory prayer. What does that mean? I pray for you. I it means that we pray with an attitude that we want not just God to be, but we want to be instrumental as well. We are harmonizing or again with his fate, with his will for a particular situation. And we want to be instrumental as well. Why should we ask God to do something? Whatever it is, find the keys. 
It strengthens our faith. Yeah, it does strengthen our faith. But it also it, it's because we know he cares. He even cares about our keys. Yeah. It also gives him domain in that situation where he may not have it otherwise. He can work now because we have given him the glory of finding the keys or whatever it is. Now, can he work as well in finding the person? Yes. Yes. We might need to pray longer though, huh? Are we interested in doing that? No. We've got to be ready. We've got to wait. And we've got to keep on praying. That's the intercessory prayer. Hold on. Thank you, Paul. Appreciate that. We never have enough time, but Jan is going to take a little bit and lead us through some of whatever she can get to of, of, uh, of Tuesday and Wednesday, right? Yes. Wednesday uh, and Thursday. Yeah, Tuesday and Wednesday. Your, yeah, Tuesday and Wednesday. If you have your Bibles, uh, please turn to Philippians chapter 1 and verse 3. We'll start in verse 3. Uh, Paul did a lot of praying for people. Uh, is your name Alice? Alice, yes. She had her hand up. Alice, did you have your hand up? Oh, just a minute. We're not hearing you, Alice. Not hearing you, but... Okay, sorry about that. It does, you're not muted, so we're glad you're there. Paul prayed for a lot of people over the years. Uh, uh, and he had the, the earnest type prayers where God found these people and brought them to him because of Paul's prayers. But I like Philippians. Philippians is called the joy for me. Paul is so joyful. And I mean, he wrote this from prison and he knew that he was going to be beheaded pretty soon. And yet he was, he was there and he was um, very happy to present the word of God to others. And he said, I'm thankful, my God, every upon every remembrance of you. And I think when I pray sometimes, am I thankful for the people I'm praying for? Or I'm just praying out of duty. I mean, you you pray for yourself, you pray for your spouse, you pray for your children and your grandkids, and you're probably happy to do it. But what about the neighbor down the street? You feel like you should maybe pray for them and a few others along the way, probably, probably somebody at the church. But anyway, he goes on and he says, always in every prayer of mine, making a request for you all with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. And then my one of my favorite texts, being confident of this very thing that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it unto the day of Jesus Christ. Uh, when I look at this, Paul was loved these people. And I know sometimes, well, not sometimes, I'm on Facebook and every now and again I get a little discouraged. Not, not that I'm ready to leave the Lord. I, my spiritual condition's okay, but just Sometimes the burdens of life get to be more than I can deal with by myself. So I'll put on Facebook, I, I, I need prayer. And I'm thinking, you know, probably nobody will pray. And then I look later in the day and 50 or 60 people have said, we're praying for you. We understand some of what you're going through. And I start to feel better, you know, because I know that people are there that care. And they're not praying great, big, long prayers. They're not spending hours and hours, but they're just asking the Lord to please be with me. And I think that's what we need to do. And as I was thinking about this, I was thinking that maybe what we need to do sometimes is just get out the church directory. I know uh, Wayne last Sabbath said something about calling the shut-ins. Well, maybe we just need to call, pick out a pick out a name or two. And maybe every day just call one person, one different person and just say, Hi, I just was thinking about you. And I know some of you work, and some of us don't work. 
some of us just sit around and don't do much. But uh, <laughs> those of you who work, you're not getting out of this either. You need to pick up your phone, call somebody. You don't have to talk for hours. Unless you call me, then you're probably going to talk for hours. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, we need to do stuff like that. And then getting back here, uh, and I, I want to tell you one thing. I consider myself an, not a teacher. I consider myself as a, oh my goodness, I forgot the word what I am, a facilitator. So I want, you've been doing well, but I haven't heard from Richard and Evelyn. They're just sitting there. <laughs> and Allison, I don't know Allison's husband's name, but they're, Isaac. I guess, they, Isaac, well, Allison, I guess. Allison Isaac, but I think we're having a computer problem and it's not letting them talk to us. Been there and done that. <laughs> <laughs> so rest of you, you know, kind of jump in if you want to say something, but wouldn't it be interesting if you got a letter from Paul and this was a letter to you? What would, out of those verses from 3 to 11, I've already said that 6 was a good verse, but what else did you get out of those texts? Look at look in your Bible. If you haven't had a chance to read it, just skim through it right now. Tell me, what do you think? What do you think the people of the uh, Philippi thought of this when they got this letter from Paul? I know sometimes in the Corinthians, I'm not sure I would have wanted the letter from Paul from the Corinthians, but this one sounds pretty good. I mean, the, the first thing that I think of, um, especially right now, is isolation. Um, I have a newfound respect for for um, people who, who don't get out very much, um, who might be shut in now. And Paul was shut in completely. He was... He was um, his writings and, and the people that he was communicating with were his only source uh, of getting out. And, um, and I think that knowing that, that there is someone to do the work that you started or, or whatnot, I think that that brings um, joy and peace, even in isolation. Um, and I think that that was, I think that's potentially where, where he was at. And and he couldn't get an instant Facebook response from 50 people. He had to wait until, you know, weeks or months went by and somebody happened to come carrying a letter and then hope that the guards let it in to him. And, but still, he knew they were praying and he was praying for them. Okay, that's good. Anybody I, else? I think the people, when they get a letter like this, when you think of Paul, in prison in a dark place water dripping no sanitation and to get a letter like this of thankfulness and confidence um that it would truly be an encouragement when they say boy if paul can be thankful and confident so can we yeah and you look back at paul's life and all the stuff he went through my word i'm surprised he remained faithful but he had a trust in god like Mm -hmm. that we need to have that kind of trust too and i i think that's that's what what it boils down to is who do we trust no matter what the difficult situations are or what the happy situations are we can still trust in god to take care of us i mean i haven't been beaten up for my faith i haven't been shipwrecked haven't been in prison so i'm living a pretty good life and so the rest of you maybe some of you have been beaten up i don't know but uh Don in verse 9, and he said, and this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and discernment. What is discernment? Understanding. Knowing, oh, sorry. Yeah, knowing the difference between right and wrong, good and evil. Okay. So he wants them to have knowledge. He wants discernment that they may approve the things that are excellent that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of christ being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by jesus christ to the glory and praise of god what are the fruits of righteousness what are the fruits of righteousness would it be the same as the fruits of the spirit yes i, I would think so and Love, look at, joy, look, peace. Yeah. When you look at that list, 
Do you find things in your life that are of that list? The, the love, joy, peace, long suffering, goodness. And that's about all. I can never remember the others. <laughs> faithfulness, gentleness, self control. Yeah, but as you look at your own life, and you don't have to confess, but sometimes I look at my own life, and, and we're supposed to have all those all the time. And I have, there's eight of them, I think, and sometimes I have six, sometimes I have five, on occasion, maybe one or two, you know, it seemed, but the spirit is there to show us the way. Okay, let's, anything else on Tuesday's lesson? Wade, did you have something to say? Yeah, no, I was just saying that I'm embarrassed to say that, I shouldn't say I'm embarrassed to say, but I've come to the realization that none of those exist in, in me and that any of those that are exhibited are there because God, because of what God is doing with me, but not because of me. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I guess that I just felt that was just a given that it wasn't from us because there's none of those in me ever. It's only through the Holy Spirit. Anything else on Tuesday's lesson? Well, just uh, I think it's commendable for Paul to have the fruits of the Spirit in the environment that he was in. You know, the fruit oh, yeah. of love, joy, peace, patience, long suffering, kindness, goodness, self control. He showed that in the most adverse conditions of living. Well, uh, in our intercessor, and uh, Paul didn't have time to get to this, but I just wanted to quickly bring this out on Monday's lesson, the last part that when Jesus prayed for somebody, he prayed for, in praying for Peter, he mentioned Peter by name. It's easy to say, Lord, be with all the members of the church. I mean, that's nice, but wouldn't it be better to say, be with the hotters, you know, they're off on vacation, help them to have a wonderful time on their vacation. Actually mention people by name. And he says he also, he would be praying for him. Satan understood quite a bit about Peter. So when we're praying for people, we need to kind of understand that person too. Like Jesus knew that Peter was going to deny him. And so he prayed for him. Okay, that's all I want to bring on Monday because that was Paul's. Now on Wednesday, unseen work, unseen powers at work. Uh, intercessory prayer is a mighty weapon in the battle between good and evil that we call the great controversy. One of the clearest revelations of the struggle is in Daniel 10. Did any of you read Daniel 10 this week? Don't everybody raise your hand at the same time. <laughs> anyway, Daniel 10 was about, this, about uh, Daniel's prayer. He was concerned because it was getting at the end of the 70 weeks. It was 70 weeks, no, 70 years, 70 years that the children of Israel were supposed to be able to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple and rebuild the city of Jerusalem and go back to Israel area. And he started praying and he prayed and he prayed. How long did he pray for? Three weeks. Three weeks, 21 days he prayed. And he said he fasted and prayed. Did that mean he didn't eat anything for 21 days? Not necessarily. Yeah. Do you realize that what we're doing here on the television is just a little bit behind? It says, I ate no pleasant food, you know, so he probably didn't eat ice cream and different things. Like oh. <laughs> <laughs> You're probably right on that. <laughs> probably, didn't. probably didn't. But as he was there, he was praying and praying and praying for 21 days. And I think he was getting up, maybe getting a little discouraged. I don't know. But who showed up after 21 days? An angel. What angel? A certain man clothed in. What was the angel? What did he look like? Like a man. Okay. Well, did he? And his waist was girded with gold of euphaz. Okay. He looked pretty much like the description of Jesus. All right. His uh, eyes is like torches of fire, his arms and feet like varnished bronze in, in color. And the sound of his words like the voice of multitude. 
Okay. So he didn't. And, and we've got about another minute or two or okay. whatever. You need. Well, let's quickly get through here then. Um, when Daniel's prayer, he, the angel came and he finally explained to them that he wanted to be there. He wanted to come and talk to Daniel, but he couldn't. Why couldn't he come? Because of the enemy detaining him. That's right. Who was the enemy? The adversary. The devil himself. <laughs> Okay, the devil himself. Yes, he he came and he said uh, the 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 angel said I couldn't. And then who else showed up? Michael. Michael. Who is Michael? Jesus. Okay, and he's also the head of the angels, right or wrong? Think about that one this afternoon. Okay, let me see. We we'll go uh, now. The question at the bottom of the page is: How do you see the reality of the great controversy? playing out in your own life. And we don't have time to think about that out loud and for you to tell, tell us this, but think about that. How do you see this playing out in your own life? And now, um, Homer, it is your turn. You can do Thursday and Friday. Thank you, Jan and Paul, both of you, thank you. I wish we had a little more time on that, uh, how the great controversy is playing out in our own lives. I think we all are seeing that. You know, I was I was thinking about some of the temples and things that that we've seen pictures of or visited in different places. And if you've ever noticed in a Buddhist temple, they'll often have rows of bells, big bells. And you, you pick up a gong, uh, uh, like a mallet at one end, and you walk down, bong, 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 bong. Uh, not you, not me, but people walk down. And as they do that, they believe the bells are saying prayers for them. In fact, they're loaded with different numbers of prayers and, and certain bells give more prayers than others. And, and so they're, they're just going along doing it. All through the Middle East and in many Catholic countries, you'll see people with prayer beads and they're, and they're thumbing them as they're standing there. They may be having a conversation with you. They may be doing something else totally their mind somewhere else but as they thumb those beads they believe that they're sending up prayers why is that a problem why is it a problem to hit the gongs or spin the wheel in some temples or or thumb the prayer beads what what's the problem with that there's no direct um investment or involvement in your relationship with what you're saying um we don't communicate with each other it's considered rude if i sit down at a table with you and i have my cell phone and i'm texting and talking to you at the same time it's considered rude because i'm not investing myself holistically in our conversation or in our meeting it's a it's a sign or a showing of less and um it's not just that it's rude when it when we're talking about this in relationship to God. It's it's deeper than that. It's that God wants an intense relationship with us. Yep. And so that connection, he doesn't want anything to come between us and that direct conversation or that direct connection that we can have with him. Amen. Excellent illustration, Wade. That direct and specific at times communication. Evelyn, do you have the the by the quarterly there? Yeah. Could you read the first paragraph on Thursday's lesson? Uh, throughout the Bible? Yep. Throughout the Bible, there is an emphasis on specificity in prayer. Yeah, I had you read it because I couldn't pronounce that word <laughs> very well. But no, but. <laughs> prayer is not some vague longing of the soul. It presents God with specific requests. Jesus prayed specifically for his disciples. The Apostle Paul prayed very specifically for the Ephesian, Philippian, and Colossian Christians. He prayed for his young colleagues, such as Timothy, Titus, and John Mark. Okay, thank you. You know, God doesn't want just some mindless mumbling like like wade said you know be doing our cell phone while we're supposedly sending a prayer to him or in a relationship he wants a loving relationship 
and he wants us to talk to him specifically about things. What's the difference? What's the difference between a friend, a psychiatrist, and a voter? Oh my! A friend, a psychiatrist, and a voter. Mm. Well, in my mind, the difference is what you talk to them about. Okay, mm -hmm. if if um, if you look at there's a little there's a little quote that we often quote from Steps to Christ, page ninety three, and I'm going to ask you just out of your memory to finish it for me. I'm going to start it. It says, "Prayer is the opening of the heart to God as to a friend. a friend." Okay, as to a friend, you know, God wants us to share our joys and our sorrows our struggles and our victories, our dreams and our disappointments with him. But if all we share are the joys, the victories, the dreams, we're just like a politician talking to her voters, aren't we? My dreams, my joys, my victories, everything that goes well. I mean, that's, that's what a politician talks about. If all we share are our sorrows and struggles and disappointments and how bad everything's going, isn't that what we do with our psychiatrist <laughs> down with the counselor? If, if we're a friend, we share the good and the bad, don't we? If we're, hey, Malachi, if we're a friend, we, we want to talk about everything in our lives. And God wants us to share all of those with, it, with him. How do we get comfortable talking with a friend? Um, I don't know, Shri, how did you and Roy get comfortable talking to each other? You know, it comes by um, practice, right? Well, and it's from positive reinforcement too. If every time you talk to somebody, the outcome is negative, you really don't want to talk to that person anymore. That's and, and what you were asking earlier, I was, I was thinking, I've, I've read this, um, story of, of this person who trained their dog to press buttons for whatever it is that they want. And if they want to go outside, it, they press a button for that. If they're, if they want to, to cuddle, they press a button for that. If they're upset that they're leaving, they press a button for that. If they want to eat. And, and that reminded me of the prayer bells that you were just talking about. And um, I was thinking, you know, if, if, if we reduce our prayers to just some formula, then what was the purpose of God giving us this beautiful gift of communication? We have this gift that, that isn't shared with any other species on this earth, um, you know, but, but we have this ability to talk to each other and, and, and it goes deeper than that. So that's the communication that I believe that God is searching for. I also want to say, to add to what Sherry said, that um, the other part that of development of a friendship or the ability to communicate with a friend is just familiarity, just to be there, just to be present to. Um, you're not very comfortable talking to somebody you don't know very well or that you're not familiar with. It's true. And um, I think part of our problem with communication with God is that we're not familiar with him because he's not a integral part of our day or we don't present to ourselves to him on a level where we become comfortable in communication or connecting with him. Amen. And Wade, that's exactly where I wanted to end up. I, I appreciate you sharing that. We, we aren't comfortable with him because we don't spend time with him sometimes. We need to test and try. If I talk to a friend, and the next day I find out that everybody in the community knows what I talked to that friend about, I'm going to be a whole lot more careful the next time. But it takes that testing, that, that experimenting, that, and God wants us to do that with him. I want to end with, with a quote, for, uh, maybe two quotes. from This one is from volume seven of the Testimonies, page 21. It says, why do believers... Why do not believers feel a deeper, more earnest concern for those who are out of Christ? Why do not two or three meet together and plead with God for the salvation of some special one and then for still another? 
you know, I think God wants us to talk to him. And if, if several of us that are meeting together in a prayer meeting or, or wherever we're meeting together, if, if we would share a burden for somebody and pray for them, maybe God would put something on our heart to reach out to that person. And eventually we could then add another person. And I like this quote from the adult Bible study guide. Satan cannot endure to have his powerful rival appealed to, for he fears and trembles before his strength and majesty. At the sound of fervent prayer, Satan's whole host trembles. Mm -hmm. So let's pray together and then we'll get ourselves ready for the next service. Dear Lord, thank you that we can pray, that we can talk to you, that it's not some mindless exercise, although sometimes we almost fall into that rut. I pray that we will be treating you as a friend, that we will be spending time with you, and that even together we will be spending time with you. When we have a friend, we want to bring others into that circle of friendship as well. And I pray that you'll be with each of us, some that are now getting ready to go to the church for the church service, some that will be getting ready to watch it on their computers. We just pray that your spirit will be poured out and that wherever we are, we will be drawn closer to you and equipped and ready for your soon return in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you again, Paul and Jan and everybody else. We will see you later. Thanks. Have a blessed Sabbath. There's nothing unusual about the Adventist Church being involved in mission. Mission has always been our focus, but there is something very unusual about a new mission movement taking off in Tokyo. The church in Japan has a burden for the millions of unreached people living in their capital city. They know that without new mission methods, these people will remain unreached. So they invited the General Conference and the Northern Asia Pacific Division to partner with them to create Mission Unusual, a massive church planting and disciple making movement. Key to the development of Mission Unusual are the global mission centers, which focus on creating resources to share the gospel with unreached people groups. Today I'm in Tokyo, one of the world's largest cities. With a population of 40 million, the challenge is great before us. But guess what? Our God is greater. He has given us this mandate in Revelation 14, 6 and other places in Scripture to go to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. So how are we doing? Well, we're not home yet. And that's where we as an Adventist family worldwide can focus on reaching the unreached people groups of the city. There's growing diversity in Japan and the people embrace a variety of lifestyles and subcultures. This includes young people like Sunny Bunny, who use fashion as a form of self-expression. The team of church planting missionaries is already on the ground, learning the language and how best to share Jesus with the Japanese. In time, they'll start new groups of believers who will in turn disciple others. Eventually, they'll be supported by the ministry of global mission pioneers, urban centers of influence, volunteers, and tent makers in a concerted effort to reach the entire city for Jesus. Helping to lead this team is Pastor Nozomu Obara, the president of the East Japan Conference. For years, he's had a passion for church planting, and he and his wife, Sachiko, are actively engaged in a disciple-making ministry for children. Pastor Obara will be transitioning from his position as president to become the associate director for Mission Unusual Tokyo. Greater Tokyo area is a big area with over 40 million people. But in the heart of Tokyo City, there's about 10 million people 
and only 10 Adventist churches with about 900 worship attendees every week. So one Adventist needs to reach more than 10,000 people. Tokyo is a big challenge. To confront the challenge, Japanese pastors and missionaries will use a holistic approach to mission. Mission Unusual will plant the seeds of mission over the next five years. But the mission won't stop there. These efforts will continue to grow and impact people's lives for years to come. Our focus is not just on events and programs. Building relationships and getting involved with people is our focus. Finding out people's needs and meeting people's needs. In other words, implementing Christ's method here in Mission Unusual Tokyo. We'll keep you updated as God leads this movement and uses it for His glory. In the meantime, you too can support Mission Unusual Tokyo. Will you join me in praying for this project as it continues to unfold over the next five years to uplift Jesus in this city?